In this episode, we discuss the fundamentals of OPC UA information modeling. And my guest on this episode is Yoni Aero. Yoni is the Chief Technology Officer of a company called Process OPC, which is a leading provider of OPC and OPC UA technology with over 20 years of experience in the field. Yoni has been the main architect for Process OPC UA SDKs and is also an active member of the Technical Advisory Council and several working groups of the OPC Foundation. He has over 20 years of experience in OPC software development, training and consulting. In addition, Yoni is the chairman of the OPC Committee of the Finnish Society of Automation, which is arranging the successful yearly event OPC Day Finland. This episode is made possible by our friends at HiveMQ, who are providers of an enterprise-grade edge and cloud-based MQTT broker. So please do check them out to help support this channel. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on Industry 4.0 TV, which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So if you're new here, please do subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the interviews. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with five stars on Apple Podcast, follow on Spotify, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kudzai Mandi Teresa. Now here's my interview with Yoni. Okay, Yoni, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to talk with you. Awesome. Okay, so today I would like to talk to you about uh, the fundamentals of OPC UA, information modeling. And um, I suppose the best way for us to start this conversation is if you could describe for us what is uh, information modeling in general, and uh, in particular, what is OPC UA information modeling? Yeah, well, uh, information modeling, I think that's uh, that's a topic that hasn't been uh, talked enough in, in the past. I think in the past, the focus in industrial automation has been to just deliver data between different systems and uh, and often the data is in a very raw format so you have individual measurements but but the engineers need to know which measurement is which they have just tag names and and something that is not very clear to the uh like outsiders even or even for the insiders to understand what is what and with information modeling there are of course uh, different aspects related to that but but the idea is to level the uh, the knowledge of of the information in the system, so that you don't uh, need to figure it out so much. What are these measurements that you could uh, understand right away? That okay, this is a temperature measurement, for example, or then in a broader scope to understand that this is uh, some kind of a paper machine or a part of the paper machine or or some other industrial device and uh, bring this kind of information along with the measurements. And, and that will be a very crucial aspect in, in future when you try to use the, uh, the data from different, different machines together and, and so on. So the idea of information modeling, of course, is to model these, uh, these different devices, machines, and, and also the data, different data types and, and things like that. Awesome. Yeah, so now one of the things that I'm really uh, excited about uh, are the possibilities of the of using the OPC UA information modeling within uh, the contact the, the context of uh, Industry 4.0. So what would you say are the major benefits of uh, information modeling as far as Industry 4.0 is concerned? Yeah, well, within Industry 4.0, uh, the big target is to standardize uh, different interfaces to different machines, uh, different systems. And uh, in fact, we are nowadays talking about this plug and produce uh, concept uh, where we think that you could just purchase new machines from different vendors, uh, put them in uh, as part of your production and, uh, and uh, as easy as possible, just make them uh, part of your, uh, your production line. But everybody knows that uh, the main tackle is not to just plug it in, uh, to the physical uh, system, the major uh, hassle is to connect it to all the uh, information systems that are that are in the uh, in the factory already. And uh, 
that is a lot of manual work in general. And within Industry 4.0, there are different uh, uh, aspects in standardizing the, uh, the connections between the systems. But information model is, uh, is the highest level, the semantic level, where we also try to uh, like define standard information interfaces for different systems uh, and, and like standardize what does a robot, what kind of information does it provide independent of the vendor, of the manufacturer of the, of the system so that the users would have it easier to uh, use similar uh, devices, similar machines from different vendors and, and plug them easily within their production process, which is always different for everybody. And, uh, and I, I think that the industry 4.0 is kind of trying to level this, uh, this kind of intelligence level, or we're talking about smart manufacturing, where the smartness it's always a good question that how smart can you go, but but I I like to say that uh, you can't be smart if you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we talk about information model, it's it's all about defining what are we talking about. So we start by modeling, just naming things. What what names do we use? Do we use do we call a temperature measurement temperature or something else? And do we talk about Celsius? Uh, decrease or Fahrenheit decrease or maybe both and, and this kind of information that that uh, that is shared between different vendors and and this is I think in general this is something that nobody needs to own per se it's just like in the past everybody had their own conventions for defining these things and within industry 4.0 we're trying to standardize that everybody would just talk about the same things in the same way and understand things in the same way but it's it's much more complicated than what it sounds. So that's why it's taking a long time to accomplish. Awesome. Yeah. So we're going to get uh, uh, into like the kind of standardizations uh, uh, as far as companion specifications are concerned a bit later on uh, uh, during this talk. Uh, for now, what I would like for us to do is to like kind of go a bit deeper into the uh, the information model itself, because as I understand it. The fundamental aspect of information modeling in OPC VA is the is the unified object model. So, can you first of all describe for us what is the structure or, or composition of an OPC UA uh, unified object model? And as a follow up to that question, uh, explain how or, or why that uh, object model enables uh, the description of complex industrial systems. Yeah, that's that's a very good question, and and. Uh... I must admit that when you uh, start working with the OPC UA information models, they are not necessarily uh, easy to grasp at first look, and and you need to get yourself familiar uh, uh, what are the uh, kind of semantics already that we're talking about in in the base level, and depending on where you're coming, you might have seen uh, different ways of of modeling uh, similar things, like we talk about semantic modeling in different aspects and OPC UA. Uh, is defining their own kind of uh, semantic language, which uh, is very abstract, uh, but rather concise. And uh, together with this, it kind of enables you to model all kinds of uh, uh, structures and all kinds of relationships between different structures. And uh, I think that's the, that's the kind of main concept. So. Uh, then, if we if we look at how how does how does OPC UA do this, it's basically uh, defining uh, things called nodes and references. And uh, node is an abstract concept, but uh, but it has different like uh, standard uh, subtypes. I could say. Typically, we're talking about just objects and variables. And the objects are used to define uh, structures like devices, machines, and their parts, and so on. How are they constructed? And then variables are used for the measurements and parameters and, and things like that. That are then the data that we are actually monitoring. But within with the objects and, uh, and variables, we can like model the structure of the measurements, and then we can understand that okay, this temperature is part of this. Uh, uh, calendar in in uh, 
in a paper machine, for example, all this uh, rotation speed is part of that and, and things like that. Uh, but then uh, a big aspect of, of the OPC UA, what makes it also special is that it's, it, in addition to just modeling these objects and variables that are like defining the certain uh, specific uh, structure in the factory that is running, it's also including uh, metadata. And metadata means in this context, it means that we can define st uh, standard types for for these things. So we can, uh, for example, define a standard paper machine type or a standard uh, temperature measurement type. And, uh, and this already gives ideas what kind of structure can we expect if we meet uh, a paper machine, we can already expect that it has a certain structure. This can, of course, be refined within different uh, brands of paper machines or different varieties of paper machines. But we can already have like a certain uh, basic concepts that we know of uh, from the type that is defined for, for a paper machine. So uh, with this type information, it's, it's kind of the design of different systems. And then we have an instance of the paper machine, which is one uh, specific machine, which has then the real measurements within it. But OPC UA information model contains these both. And uh, whenever you find a measurement, you can find uh, what is it part of. And also you can find that this part, what type of a machine or, or device it is. And with that information, you can uh, really be clever. Like I said that if you want to be smart, you want to do smart manufacturing, you need to know what you're talking about. But if you know what you're talking about and what, you, what kind of uh, machines you are you are working with, you can also uh, develop intelligent algorithms that already know how to work with a paper machine, how to analyze a paper machine, for example. And this kind of uh, information, if you know something uh, beforehand about paper machines, you can uh, prepare that whenever you meet a paper machine in a, in a real installation, you can do so certain operations with that or certain analysis with that. And that is what this, uh, this OPC UA information model enables, that whenever you connect uh, to an OPC UA server, uh, you can find uh, everything related to the paper machine, for example, and then you can identify that, okay, yeah, this is part of, this is the calendar part, so I can uh, perform this kind of operation on it and, and things like that. Or I can analyze the speed of it because the calendar has a speed and, and these kind of things. And uh, the higher level you uh, think about this, the more uh, kind of intelligent you can be with your with your uh, within your systems. And of course, it's it's very big part of the integration of, of different systems, so that you can prepare the integrations in a in a more clear way. Oh, okay, very interesting. So yeah, you have given us a very good understanding of um, uh, OPCA information modeling and and how it works. Uh, but now I'm sure some members of the audience here would be wondering uh, what tools are available for working with or building uh, uh, OPCA information models. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, of course, uh, you first have to learn uh, that what are the systems that you that you work with, and uh, and depending what you really want to do with the information models, you might just want to be using the models or you might want to be developing the models. And, uh, and for using the models, uh, you, of course, have to take uh, the products that, uh, that have the OPC UA capability and see what kind of uh, support they have for the information models and how you can use those. And that's, uh, that's uh, varying uh, depending on the systems quite much. If you are on the developer side, uh, you have tools uh, that you can use for, for modeling, uh, creating these models. Uh, Unified Automation, for example, has a tool called UA Modeler, and there are some other uh, commercial tools available in the market that, uh, that help you create these models. Uh, OPC Foundation has defined a standard uh, format for uh, storing these models and exchanging them between the systems. So, uh, so the good thing is that whatever tool you, you use, you should always be able to use the same format and uh, 
then deliver and transfer your models to other systems where you can use them or between even between these different tools that are used for modeling so you can uh, you can use and, and find the best tools for yourself and and then uh, independent of that there is a standard format that that the models are are defined in and and you should be uh, ready to go awesome okay so so primarily there is um two approaches to uh, uh, building an uh, OPC UA information model uh, uh, for like a machine or system. So you could like build a custom information model and you could also uh, use uh, OPC UA companion specifications. So maybe first of all, uh, to kind of like uh, attack the, the, the standardization uh, uh, a problem that you spoke about, can you just maybe briefly explain uh, to for the benefit of the audience what OPC UA companion specifications are? And then uh, what I would like to find out from you after that is uh, under what circumstances is it av advisable to build a custom OPC UA information model? And uh, when is it better to use uh, an uh, OPC UA companion, uh, companion specification? Yeah, yeah. the uh, OPC Foundation is indeed uh, uh, developing uh, different levels of information models that could be like available for the, uh, for the industry as they are. Uh, these are uh, more or less domain specific, but of course everything starts from very generic models and, uh, and within the OPC uh, base specifications we have just a few like base models. We have for example the data access uh, model, we have alarms and conditions model and we have like historical access model. Of these the alarms model is, is the most uh, wide uh, or how would you say like has has the most definitions it's like standardizing how alarm information is handled in general and defining certain standard types for alarm management but these are very generic and uh, they're not really like uh, considering any industrial domains as such the idea with the company specifications is uh, is to incorporate uh, models from different uh, industrial domains within OPC UA but uh, typically OPC Foundation is, is not defining new models and they are not trying to be expert on, on every industrial domain. So uh, the idea typically is that uh, take a look at the different industrial domains and find what kind of uh, semantic models have already been defined there and then bring those into OPC UA. So typically it's more or less like rewriting the semantic model uh, that is done in, uh, in some proprietary way with XML uh, definitions or, or something else. Write them again with the OPC UA semantic language with, and create an OPC UA version of that model. And that work is typically done together with OPC Foundation and another organization that is more of the industrial expert on this field and typically we're talking about joint working groups which are like doing the, uh, joining their uh, work effort and they create these models together and we talk about company specifications because the end result is really like incorporated within OPC specifications and and if you look at uh, the OPC specification these days you see that they they are numbered nowadays there are different uh, like sets of, of models and we already having like tens of uh, different uh, parts in the OPC UA specifications and most of these parts are these company specifications. And uh, we have some generic level models uh, that the OPC foundation is mainly responsible of like the device uh, information model that is more or less defining uh, ways how to standard standardize how devices, industrial devices are identified and, and so forth. Uh, then OPC Foundation is working very closely together with the BDMA, uh, which is an international organization representing especially the machine uh, builders in different domains. And BDMA has uh, been defining a generic model for machinery. And, and then they also working with different uh, uh, kind of industrial domains, for example, with robotics and uh, machine vision and so on. And these models, uh, as 
possible they are extending the device model and the machinery model and and with this uh, like create more specific models for these domains but but still most of these models can only be quite generic because uh, they can define very specific uh, aspects of of different type of robots for example uh, and that work is typically done uh, by the robot manufacturers themselves uh, but within the robot uh, model the generic model can define as much as possible as much as is common uh, within different robots but then uh, the robot manufacturers probably will create their own specific models for their own robot models and that's where uh, where you typically start uh, creating your own models is when you when you have your own specific needs and uh, and the good thing is always to look at the company specifications what is already available and then like extend those so instead of starting from totally from scratch you can just like take the standard part and then extend it with your own own additions but of course if you still don't find any uh company specifications that match your needs then you you can always start uh, with your own model based on just the base base models of OPC UA and, and create your own types for your own needs and then also then it's it's good to like consider that it's better to typically to just try to model your your device types or your your uh, component types or whatever you want to model and and create a model that okay all of my systems that I'm producing follow this structure and use these kind of measurements and try to model that and not uh, think so much that you would use the uh, these modeling tools for modeling installations in, in certain factories or in certain places but rather try to concentrate on that you want to model your device types or, or system types or even production line types but uh, but then leave this uh, like the real OPC UA server uh, to then use these models for the metadata, but then uh, consider them more like projects that uh, that are then actually defining the data within the project scope, and and that is more like dynamic. You can if you take it or consider like a production line, it's it's not very static, so. I mean that you can always like any day you can install a new device there and so it's it's like a changing model but that's better to be done with the with the tools uh, that you have for the opc ua communication like within the opc ua server itself itself and uh and that of course then depends on on the capabilities of the of the tool sets that you have in hand there and uh and that is something uh I think it's still like uh, kind of work in progress because like the recent, I would say five to 10 years, there's been a lot of activity in defining the different models, defining the tools that you can uh, use to build the different models. But, uh, but there's still not so much uh, functionality within all OPC UA server products that could take benefit of all these possibilities of, of the modeling. So that is something that I see that uh, will be happening in future that that these tools will get also more clever and, and provide you more opportunities to really uh, take advantage of these information models. Oh, awesome! Yeah, that uh, makes a, a, a lot of sense. And maybe just to sidetrack here a bit, uh, one of the interesting projects that I've been following closely is the uh, OPC Cloud Library. Uh, I'm not sure how much you kind of like think about that. Are you able to share insights on how that fits into the picture? Yeah, sure. So I've, I've been uh, following that and, uh, and we've been prototyping uh, support for that also. We have, uh, now that I'm starting to uh, talk about the topic of using products, for example, if you don't have any products that you want to uh, use for, uh, for playing around with the uh, information models, you can always take uh, process OPC UA simulation server and, and, and learn for yourself how does it work, work in practice. And we've been prototyping uh, something in relation to the simulation server uh, in regards to the cloud library. Uh, we still haven't published anything and, and maybe in, in uh, 
in your future we will have something to uh, to show for that as well and and that will then enable you to like try it out yourself but the idea with the cloud library is, is to like tackle this uh, this like bigger problem that uh, OPC UA servers are typically residing on premise they are near the near the real equipment near the real uh, production line production monitoring systems manufacturing execution systems and so on but uh, the trend nowadays is to move more and more data to the cloud uh, so that it's taken out of the factory of course the cloud can also uh, reside inside the factory in which case we call this kind of a fog installations or on-premise cloud installations but anyways the idea is that it's it's not next to the uh, production process necessary anymore but it's taken to the cloud and the benefit of the cloud is that then you can uh, use different kind of cloud tools to analyze the information and then make it available for anybody in the uh, through the internet in a secure way uh, so the data doesn't need to have a kind of constant connection to the actual production process but now uh, the main question comes that how do we use these uh, information models if we have the data in the cloud? And the cloud library is, is part of the solution uh, where you can still access the information models, although you are not directly connected with the OPC UA servers that uh, originally host these uh, information models as well. So it's kind of a, uh, you could think that it's like an, uh, uh, of the uh, of the factory installation of uh, or a repository of of different information models that you can uh, use and link your data even if the data is in the cloud and uh, in practice it's uh, like a standard part of the OPC UA standard that is defining interfaces for accessing these uh, these information models. Uh, it's not necessarily using OPC UA for communication, but it's using uh, REST interfaces. So it's easy to use from different uh, web-based applications, for example. And, uh, and the idea is that you have like a central location or you have your own location uh, where you're hosting these information models. Uh, and you can keep them up to date, or if you use the standard one, you can have a place where all these information and models are always available and up to date and so on. So it's kind of uh, making it more easy to use all these tens of uh, information models that OPC Foundation and the other organizations are publishing without you maintaining them yourself or being dependent on what the products are using and supporting and, and so on. So that's the idea. It's kind of standardizing how do we use these information models instead of defining what the models contain. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, now, so moving on, um, for the benefit of, uh, say, machine builders uh, and uh, maybe software vendors. So let's say I have a machine or product and I would like to um, uh, integrate an OPC UA information model into it. What, what does the workflow uh, for achieving that look like? Like, what are the stages that I would have to go through to come up with a complete solution, like a product that has got an uh, OPC UA information model? Yeah, so uh, as I described, uh, OPC uh, Foundation and BDMA and other organizations have been defining this company and specifications. So I, I would say that the first step, of course, is to take a look if there is a company specification that uh, already touches your type of machines or defines models for your type of machines. And then uh, take a look at those more in detail and see how, how well they fit for you. And, uh, and then uh, consider if you need to extend them or make them more refined, that they more specifically define uh, the aspects of your machine, which typically is the case. So then uh, the first step that you need to do yourself is, is to model uh, your machine type more detailed define all the measurements and the structures of your type and create your own machine type as an OPC UA definition and create your own information model of that and then the next 
step is of course to take that in use within your products uh, you will need to have an OPS QA server that is serving the information from your machine uh, if you don't have that you need to consider how do you uh, add that uh, OPS QA server to your machine and then you, uh, you try to find a product that can uh, use these information models import that type information in there and then you can uh, like instantiate uh, OPC UA objects that follow this uh, type specification and those objects are then supposed to model the real uh, machines that are being installed within the factories and then you need to consider that how do you like uh, enable the connection to these real machines and how they can expose the information that they have and structure it according to these information models and, and that can vary depending on what tools you use with the OPC UA server if you're developing it from scratch with uh, with some tools like we are producing the uh, SDK level products or if you're using some uh, off-the-shelf uh, uh, control center applications that have OPC UA server within them and then you need to study how you can use information model within those and how you can uh, take benefit of, of that. Or whatever uh, the case is, you need to figure out how to implement this. Or uh, even uh, one good chance is that uh, if you are using PLCs uh, to implement the control logic of, of your machine, PLCs uh, can use, uh, okay, they can provide for us. Uh, First of all, an OPC UA server from themselves, and then they can uh, also use information models. One tool that I didn't mention is that for the modeling, for example, is Siemens, uh, Siome, the information uh, or object modeling tool, what they have. And, uh, and that uh, tells that Siemens, for example, has a good level of support for, for uh, information models within uh, S7 PLCs, for example. So you need to take a look at what are the products that you're using and, and how they enable you to use the models then. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, so for the most part, uh, industrial system integrators uh, are the ones that get to like work with uh, OPCA systems in a real world environment. And as you have already alluded to, uh, not much uh, of uh, OPCA information modeling is, uh, uh, is being used so what do you think is the impact of uh, information modeling to system integrators when you like get to start to work with uh, with it in a real world environment how would that change how they have to like integrate systems yeah in the beginning i mentioned this uh, plug and produce principle and and uh, i've seen the industry really, really like demand this kind of uh, easy connectivity options especially in industries where they're using a lot of different type of machines uh, to really build their uh, production processes and and when especially when they need to modify their production processes or take for example the pharma industry where they even need to validate the production process after each change that they are making uh, the integrators are playing a big role there because they are doing their the real work for uh, integrating new machines as part of the production process but uh, if they always need to, first of all, find out what is the interfacing technology for this uh, component, this machine, what does the model look like there? How do I really incorporate this information in my uh, high level systems that can take days, weeks, months uh, very easily. But, uh, but now the, uh, if you have a standard interface, you have OPC UA interface, which is a standard, you have information models that are standardizing the semantic level, you can reduce that configuration time remarkably. If the people already kind of know that, okay, this is the model that we follow, they understand what, what the data is, instead of trying to figure out what, what is the machine actually uh, providing and how to use this machine. And, uh, and then of course, the higher level we go, you can even like just integrate the whole machine to the whole uh, production line or within the production control systems and MES systems. Uh, at best, just like you plug and play with the with the cord, you just plug it in the socket and and you're ready to go. 
because this sounds still like a utopia that you could just do it like that with machines with their uh, uh, rather complicated uh, information models or at least uh, very different information models. But this is the trend that uh, that we are like following that these kind of things can get easier and easier the more we use these standard models. And that's that's the big benefit that, that I really would like to see, see in future. Oh yeah, that'll be really interesting to see how that uh, future uh, pans out. Now, uh, one other thing that I think would be crucial to understand is uh, what is the relationship between OPC UA uh, information modeling and uh, ISA 95? That's a very good question. And ISA 95 is actually, it's, it's a very good example of a domain specific information model, or it's not even in such like a domain specific because it's still like a standard uh, level of information model. But that's an example, a good example of an information model that's already been defined somewhere else by another organization. The ISA has defined this already uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, and it, it's containing uh, like standard ways how to deal with uh, the equipment in the industry, also with personnel and, and test descriptions and, and, and these kind of things. And uh, OPC Foundation has worked already, uh, I think almost 10 years ago, they started the work to incorporate ISA 95 as one company specification in OPC UA. And, uh, and there we see a good example that we had a model defined with some other language, some other means, and that's been transformed into an OPC UA model. The idea being that, okay, then we have, we can also use ISA 95 models within OPC UA servers, and we have defined how to like convert them to OPC UA language. And uh, it's a very good example also because there we are, uh, we headed into problems that uh, this kind of semantic level mapping is not necessarily straightforward because it, it contains uh, aspects that are not like straightforward, convertible to another type of language. So depending on how these models are defined, it may be like, sometimes it's very straightforward, you just define it with the OPC UA uh, nodes and references, but sometimes uh, you end up in a, like a discussions that how should we actually do this in the OPC UA way, because different languages, natural languages also, they, they don't map like 100% straightforward. So, so this, is, uh, this is very often the, the real challenge when you are trying to bring these different models in. And then you always see that different people have been thinking about like similar things in a little bit different ways. And that's, that's a big challenge with semantic modeling is that people do think about these things in different ways. And that's what we are also trying to standardize that everybody would think about the same things the same way. And, uh, and therefore, ISA 95 is a, is a good example. And ex actually, there is an uh, update process going on. So they, they, they are updating the model at the moment. And there have been new aspects added added to the ISA 95 uh, model, of, for example, job control uh, and things like that, which can be very generic in the end and, uh, and relate to all kinds of machines uh, that how do they, all kinds of equipment, how do you control them? And, uh, and overall, I would say that uh, OPC Foundation doesn't want to do everything by themselves and they can do, they are very dependent on, on and the cooperation with other organizations. And I think that's maybe the greatest aspect of, of the OPC standardization is this cooperation between different organizations that in the end, everybody kind of comes to the same table and tries to talk the same language. And it doesn't really mean which language it is, but for some reason, OPC uh, UA has managed to like bring them all together and we have therefore a kind of common language which we can use to model all kinds of models and and i haven't really seen any any other attempt to bring all kinds of models in, within same uh in the same table in this way 
And therefore, I think that's maybe the key reason why OPC UA probably will be very successful in, in future. Or not saying that it's not successful already, but especially in this semantic modeling part as well. Oh yeah, interesting, interesting. Now talking about uh, semantics, um, uh, the interoperability uh, aspect of it, uh, the other um, thing that I would like to get clarity on is like how uh, OPSUA information modeling uh, enables like the uh, vertical integration of information. So let's say uh, in a manufacturing enterprise, we, we a customer order has been generated uh, by like an enterprise system. Does OPCUA information modeling uh, enable that semantic interoperability to allow that information to be exchanged from that um, enterprise application down to uh, a piece of production equipment that gets to execute on that order? Yeah, I would say that definitely it, it enables it. Uh, the reality though is that uh, OPCUA hasn't been regarded that much on the ERP, the enterprise resource planning system level. Uh, we are seeing it uh, a lot of MES, the manufacturing execution systems, uh, getting support for OPC UA because it's it's really shining uh, at the moment on that level between the MES and the SCADA level. Uh, you could say that OPC UA started from the PLC SCADA communication and now it's uh, getting more on the higher levels uh, and, and we're seeing a lot of MES vendors uh, looking at it that uh, and this is the level where the plug and produce can really be like uh, useful. But uh, so far, I haven't seen so much uh, interest on the ERP MES level, but definitely it would suit very well for that because OPC UA is after all just a generic way to define data delivery, whether it's measurement data or custom order uh, data or job data or whatever. You can model that with generic rules and, and use that as a standard way to communicate. But of course, it needs the people to uh, understand that this is a good way to do this and, and put effort in using it and standardizing it for these different levels. And, and since OPC UA is coming from the industry, the operational technology level, it's not so high yet on the knowledge of people that are working within this. Uh, high level IT systems. But uh, I would really like to see it coming there as well. There is one aspect, uh, though, that uh, that also, this sounds very simple that you want to take the customer and just, you just move it directly from the, uh, from the sales system, for example, to ERP, MES, and so on. But the fact is that this information is not typically taken as such. Uh, down to the production. It's typically like generating new production level information uh, on different levels. We're talking about different uh, topics. So what is important on the, on the sales system is not important in the production process. But somehow these systems are, are tied and linked together. And therefore, uh, we need different models for the same information within the production line within the MES and within the ERP system. Also, we're talking about the same production, but it's like breaking down to more details in the production. And it's uh, what's more interesting on the order level is that is the order uh, ready and who is the customer? But you don't need the customer information at the production where you're more interested in what is actually the speed of the machine. So therefore it's, it's kind of, it sounds simple to just like take the information from the low level to the high level, but in real you need to uh, convert something there or, or refine it or uh, create new information, and and that's why why it's uh, like a little bit more complicated than than it sounds at first. But we have the tools, the language, and OPCO is very generic, so you could model and use it for for all these levels, no problem, and and. The best would, of course, to be to use the same standard on each level and, and keep this keep things simplified in in that sense. Oh, okay, interesting. Now, uh, what about like for horizontal integration, like across uh, 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 manufacturing ecosystems? Do you believe uh, 
that uh, information modeling will also play a role in kind of like integrating information from various uh, manufacturing uh, ecosystems like value chains yeah yeah definitely and i think that's uh, that's like where it's really uh, is the most useful in in general again this plug and produce principle the whole idea is that uh, you could integrate different levels of machines uh, within the same MES system and use them in the same way. You wouldn't need to understand if this is a uh, washing uh, machine or if this is a assembly machine or whatever it is. You could just control them like the same way. Give them orders that okay, you you start your process now, and then and you wait there, and then you just ask that, okay, what was the result of your process? You start the next machine, and you get the results from that. And if they have some specific information, you just get that and, and store it in a background system. But but you could like do this in a coherent way and control every and each machine the same way instead of figuring out that okay, this washing machine needs to be started with the command start and, and the assembly machine needs to be started with start assembling. But and you wouldn't need to like think about the differences between these machines and 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 that's the idea with the uh, standardization within this level. And it would definitely help in this horizontal integration that you don't need to know how was this thing implemented. You just need to know that, okay, it's following, it's a machine, so I can control it like this. Oh, interesting. So, well, one thing that we are uh, certainly guaranteed of uh, is that industrial technology is going to change, you know, as it always does. Uh, only now that it's happening at a much faster rate, so bearing that in mind, do you think uh, OPC UA information modeling is, is future proof enough to, to handle changes that are going to come uh, in the industry? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think so. I think uh, the main thing that, that you need to have for, for a standard to be successful, in my opinion, is, is not like a necessarily an excellent technology, but you need to have a lot of people that are backing it up and a lot of people behind it. And that's that's where OPC UA is successful at the moment, that we have a lot of experts that have been working on it for uh, over two decades, almost. Well, OPC UA development started around two decades ago. But there's a lot of uh, people that were in the beginning are still the core team that are defining the OPC specification itself. And they are constantly they are adding more functionalities and, and improving it. But in addition to that, we have organizations like VDMA that have taken a big role in, in uh, working within these uh, information models. That is then the next level that someone needs to like be in charge of, of really using these modeling technologies and, and standardizing things on that level. And then we have an uh, enormous amount of uh, vendors that are implementing OPC UA within their systems and really like supporting it and, and like waiting for, for new uh, uh, places where they can use, use OPC UA for their benefit. And, uh, and then we have the end users that are learning that these new capabilities are becoming available. So I think it's this like this big society of people that, that ensures that it is future proof because they already putting their attention that this is a good technology that they want to use and and there's always uh, a lot of things to improve but uh, you can't improve things if people are not ready to do it well but in the end i'm not like saying that we need to improve everything a lot because we already have a like, good technology and the but I'm trying to say that this technology enables small refinements and improvements all the time, because that's been happening since the beginning. It's been improved all the time and it's being improved every day. But the improvement means that there is always a new specific need coming from another industrial domain that wants to model something else. And we can always incorporate that within OPC uh, UA. And the big thing is that the main specifications haven't really changed. They've been, uh, refined and improved but but the main technology has been there since the beginning and, and it doesn't require any changes so that's already like 
proven that it's it's future proof and now the only thing we need is is more and more people just use it and and make it shine awesome awesome so uh well talking about uh, uh changes so there's been like a a push uh within uh at the OPC Foundation to kind of introduce uh, the PubSub uh, uh, kind of uh, functionality to it. So I just want to quickly get your thoughts on um, how uh, information model would be used like uh, within a, a PubSub network, an OPC PubSub network thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, first of all, PubSub uh, is an important addition to, to OPC UA. Traditionally, OPC UA is client-server technology and that, that works very well within the factory where you have a like, constant connection between the systems. So it works very well on this PLC SCADA MES level. But if you want to take information uh, higher uh, to the cloud systems, for example, you don't necessarily have a like, constant connection and you don't even need that anymore. Because the other part of uh, pops up where it's being used is, is going down from the PLC level to the control level. So that's kind of... Uh, the funny thing about pops up that it's extending OPC UA, but it's extending it to the com to complete different directions. But I think the main uh, aspect uh, that we typically want to talk about more is, is the cloud aspect. And, uh, and there we have already seen technologies like MQTT that's been uh, very successful. And MQTT is, is rather simple and efficient way to deliver measurement information, but it's, for example, missing the standardization within uh, the semantic level. So it, it works very well if you're do, doing everything yourself and you know what the data is and, and you can you have the uh, people that can configure all the communication between the different systems. But if you want to like prepare something more standardized, that you want to prepare systems that already can expect something from devices without you knowing what devices will be, and things like that, that you want to really like use a standard way of delivering data uh, to the cloud systems, OPC UA can offer more tools. And in practice, OPC UA is using MQTT. So it's it's using these capabilities that are already there, but it's extending them with, uh, with more information within that. And uh, I would say that uh, if you look at the current specifications for PubSub, they still don't have that much uh, about the information models built in the PubSub specifications. The first level of PubSub was uh, ensuring that data can be delivered. And uh, the specifications were written in the way that you wouldn't need to depend on OBC UA that much so that you can use it as a, like a generic MQTT subscriber and you can still get the data and you can use it like it would be coming from any MQTT. Uh, publisher. But of course, as I've been telling here, OPC UA really shines on the uh, information modeling part, and that's very unique. So another question is that how do you use these information models uh, within the PubSub network or within the cloud uh, systems? We already mentioned that there's a cloud library that is, uh, has been defined to uh, like act as a central location or repository for the different information models. But then if you like uh, transferring data uh, from another channel, how do you link these together? And how do you link the data together within the information models? That is uh, still uh, a little bit an open question. But at the moment, there is specification work going on, which is defining how we can really like uh, incorporate information models within the PubSub communication as well. So the OPC UA PubSub is also not ready 100%. It's still being improved, like all the other aspects of OPC UA, but maybe the MQTT or the PubSub part is like improved more than other parts. But uh, we have new specifications coming up and, uh, and in future there will be more uh, capabilities that are incorporated within the pops up uh, communication. So today is, is like a day when you can already uh, take tools that uh, that use pops up communication. And if you want to learn more about that, I can again mention like process OPC UA simulation server and OPC UA browser, which we just uh, uh, published 
uh, a little while ago with a support for PubSub. So you can now play around with that technology and, and see how it works in practice. And, uh, and so on, but, uh, but it's still like uh, coming up with, with new features that will make it even, even uh, greater in future. And, and the, the fact is that is, there's still not so many systems that are really taking advantage of the PubSub functionality today. I also see that as a, like a future trend that people want to move more and more communication on that kind of uh, communication. I'm talking also about this kind of information bus uh, idea that uh, in you can even think that in factory in future you will have so many different systems you, you can have tens hundreds maybe even thousands of systems that are obviously UA capable but you can't like anymore connect each and every one with each other so you would uh, need this kind of a communication bus that that is containing all the information from different systems and then you can just subscribe to whatever information you need uh, on a higher level so the mqtt uh, version of opc ua pops up could also work uh, as a like a standard way to accomplish such communication network but these are like future trends still and uh, and when you when everything will be ready one day then uh, you will have an information bus there's all the uh, information models are available there through the cloud library and through the uh, through the pops up definitions and you can just plug in a new machine that starts producing data to this network and then you can just get it automatically within your MES system or ERP system and it can just like start using and communicating back back to the uh, to the new machine that's how it will be happening in future oh yeah absolutely that sounds like a very exciting future so yeah to conclude uh, this session um i'm confident that a, a large number of people who are watching or listening uh, uh, to, to this conversation uh, who have worked with opc ua have at some point uh, used or come across uh, uh, the process opc ua uh, simulation server as i have uh, but can you tell us more about uh, Process OPC, the company, and also tell us about your other product offerings? Yeah, so uh, we at Process OPC, we've uh, worked uh, with the OPC classic technology starting in the 1990s. And then uh, when OPC UA uh, was being established, we jumped in uh, to the definition work and started working on uh, on the implementations and uh, somehow uh, we became the expert of the Java implementation of OPC UA working together with the OPC foundation uh, to bring in uh, a standard implementation of, of the Java communication and, uh, and since then we've uh, been also developing tools uh, first of all to the developers so our main products are SDK uh, products for Java we're working also in cooperation with other companies, especially with the Unified Automation, uh, also to provide workshops and, and being consultants on this technology in general. But we also like want to bring uh, tools to, to people that try to learn and, and use OPC UA in practice. So we have our main, uh, main products, uh, the simulation server and OPC UA browser that are uh, basically free tools with which you can uh, learn how this UA works in practice, use them in the workshops to teach people how these things go. Uh, it's so much easier when you see and understand it and you can play with it yourself. Uh, then we've uh, come up with uh, end user applications and we are constantly looking at solutions that what kind of products we could bring in the market using our great uh, developer tools uh, to help help the industry with different needs. And, uh, and we are, uh, for example, coming up with a new edge uh, product that uh, is going to help with using the information models, even in the case when the original uh, manufacturing system, for example, doesn't take benefit of the OPC or information models. On this edge product, you can convert whatever data to follow the standard models. And we see that this is like a one of important tool in future 
to also like standardize the communication uh, when there is already like different data sources that have different level of OPC rate, you could still like uh, take benefit of the information by converting uh, whatever data on this level and then use like the standard uh, from there on. And uh, for the last few years, we put most of our uh, emphasis in the development for developing the pops up communication. Uh, and now I mentioned that these uh, free tools browser and uh, simulation server also now have uh, pops up uh, functionality and we try to make it as easy as possible to uh, to use those as well so that you can understand how does this uh, pops up really work in practice and and so on so that's what we we are like uh, trying to be ourselves that we are the experts that can help you uh, to understand what OPC UA is and also provide reliable implementations so that uh, you could get products that really work and, and do the job as, as the specifications define. And, and that's oh, yeah. our humble, humble position in, in the industry. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution to the industry. And uh, for those that are interested with uh, playing around with these uh, free tools, I'm going to provide a link uh, to download and uh, try these uh, simulation tools uh, in the description below. So yeah, that uh, brings us to the end of this session. Uh, Uni, thank you so much again for taking the time to come out and share your insights with the community. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was really enjoyable to talk with you and, and I was very happy to help people to understand these things. Thank you.